Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Great worship. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give our all of our music team a big hand, man. They they lead us into worship. I know they give all the praise to the Lord, but we appreciate all that they do to lead us into worship. A man was having his quiet time outside one day and he was laying on a grassy knoll looking at the clouds as they kind of went by. And so the man looked up and he said, Lord, I've got a question. He said, how long is a million years to you? The Lord said, it's like a minute. And Lord, how much is a million dollars to you? To me, it's like a penny. Lord, would you give me a penny? The Lord said, just a minute. You know, that kind of reminds me of what people think they can do to the Lord. No matter what, people tend to try to convince the Lord that the way they're living is right. Kind of the way that joke kind of came out. That it doesn't matter what the Lord says, they think they can twist the Lord into saying what they want Him to say or to make what it is they're doing right in the eyes of God. And it doesn't happen that way. And there was a culture, there was a culture worse than the one that we have in this world that existed in a time when God had finally drew the line and said, this is it. In 120 years, I will destroy the earth, every living creature that exists on this earth. In giving man opportunity to repent, he found one man, one man, that dared to speak out, that dared to take a stand, that dared to be righteous, that dared to have a walk with God, that dared to be different from his culture, one that would stand above the rest. And that man was a man who not only saved him, but saved his family. He was Noah. He had a faith that floats. And praise the Lord, he had enough faith to float because he was the only one with him and his family that survived. Everyone else was destroyed. And as we look at this man, Noah, we need to look at him and say, how was Noah someone that I should emulate? You know, when we read the Bible, you know, there's so many principles, there's so many uh, things for us to learn, so many commandments, so many great things that we can do to not only come to know how we need to know, know the Lord, but how we can live and how we can be victorious. But it is so great when we can see the principles lived out in someone's life, whether in the Bible or in our day to day. Because the principles just come alive when we see it lived out not just in the pages. And boy, did this man live out a life that was not just principles on a book, but he lived them out in day-to-day -day life. We're gonna be looking at one scripture, Hebrews 11, verse seven. And the first principle we're gonna see is Noah's faith involved unquestionable or unquestioned obedience. It didn't matter what was said, he would do it. If we have faith, that means we have unquestioned obedience. A lot of people try to dissect faith and obedience. Well, I got obedience, I don't have faith, or I got faith and I don't have obedience. I really can't see in the scripture where you can divide the two because if you have faith, you will obey the Lord. And when you don't obey the Lord, you're not exhibiting faith. Because you say, well, I really don't trust him here in this one area. I do in other areas, just not this area. See, but God told him, said, by faith Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. God had told him he's gonna destroy the earth in 120 years and that he was to prepare a device to save mankind that would repent of course, we know that it was only him and his family that ended up being in that ark. Everybody else rejected the message. 
and that he would send a flood to destroy the earth and him and the animals that he would rescue and two by two into the ark would be saved. And he went to him and described this vessel that he was to make to save those who would enter in. Just look at the size of this vessel. First of all, it was to be 450 feet long. That's one and a half football fields in length to get us a perspective. It was 75 feet wide, an 18-wheeler from tip of the truck to the end of the trailer. 45 feet high, a four-story building, and over one million square cubic feet of space. Can you imagine being 500 years old in his 500s and be told you're to build this yourself with possibly the help of his three sons. I mean, he ended up having three sons. With no employees, no power tools, no pneumatic tools, No chainsaw. Just that in of itself, not having that, would just boggle your mind that he would have to build this big, a monstrous ark. No unions. Well, that might have helped him right there, but uh, he didn't have any of the modern things to do it, but he built a boat. And in these measurements that God gave him was the exact measurements that God wanted this boat. The ratio was a one-six ratio. And if you check out today's modern cargo ships, they're built to that exact standard, one to six ratio. Matter of fact, in 1993, Dr. Song Hong from South Korea, who heads the world-class Ship Research Center. Yes, there is such a place. And him, even what I read, I quote from him saying, life comes from the sea. So obviously he is not a believer to have that kind of theology. So he didn't address this trying to prove anything, obviously to support Noah's Ark, but he did this research where he was able to take these various models of ships I believe 12 in all, 12 hulls that he could demonstrate to find out what proportion would make the best ship for maximum stability, maximum strength, and maximum comfort. Because every time you take away from one of those three, or add to one of those three, you take away from one of the others. If you want it more comfortable, sometimes it's less stable. You take it a little bit of stable, it's less strong. And so you try to mix them to make sure you have one that has the most of each. And when he put all these formulas together to where he was able to bring this one over, not this strength, we got to lessen some of that. When he put it, he put it right in the middle of the three and those dimensions that he came up were the identical dimensions of Noah's Ark. The world-renowned Ship Research Center says the best proportion you can put in a ship just happens to be God's proportion of Noah's Ark. I wonder, how, I wonder how God knew. Was he reading up on something? No, he's God. And from all time and time eternity, he knows the best in everything, not only shipbuilding, but people building. And we dare to question this book that it's not best for me and we try to alter it. Saying let's change the ship proportions. No, keep it all just like it is because it's always gonna be proven wrong. I mean, right, it's never been proven wrong, ever. 100%. Nothing's ever 100%, but God does, and His Word is always 100%. Could there be a greater example of obedience other than Jesus and maybe Abraham than Noah? Because this wasn't a one time thing. It wasn't, you know, God called various people to do a particular act. This took years, day after day. We know he gave mankind 120 years. We don't know how much of that span was spent building, 
We can't get that information from the scriptures as far as exactly how much of that 120 it took. But my goodness, with no power tools, that took a long time. With power tools and a crew, that'd take a long time. And day in and day out, he just kept having, every morning, having to wake up to say, I've got to be obedient to this. When you had never seen rain in your entire days of existence, you had never seen a drop, drop, much less flood. You didn't even live near water. And you had never seen a ship. More than likely ever in your life to know how to build it. The daily obedience to say, am I wasting my time? Each day, could this be a total waste of time? That I end up dying and I got this big boat out in my front yard. <laughs> I mean, really. If God, if God doesn't come through, I spent and wasted a lot of time and a lot of wood and a lot of calluses to have a real unique decoration in my front yard. Oh, that took obedience. But you know how he, it's the scripture says, thus Noah did. Well, those three words, thus Noah did. No griping, no complaining. Lord, are you serious about the size of this thing? Lord, do you know how many people I have or a few people I have to help me? Do you know how many days this is going to take? Do you know how much sacrifice this is going to take? Beside me having to preach to the people, I also need to be doing all this building. Hmm. Thus, Noah did. And he built it in reverence. See that, those two words in there? That means in the Hebrew, care and concern and devotion. He not only built it, he said, we're going to make this thing right. It's just how God did. You know when God gives you to do something, above all the things he gives us to do in life, we ought to say, the things I do for him, I'm doing right. That's whether you do your job, you do it as unto the Lord the best you can. And whatever ministry he gives you, you do it the best you can with care and devotion. You say, man, when that ship comes out, it's going to be a butte. And I'm going to make sure, because I'm going to build it in reverence. Great care. and I'm just not going to slap up. Some nail, nail a few nails. This boat is for God. And when I work, it's for God. And when I do anything, it's for God. And it'll have his signature on it in reverence. He's going to do it right. And that's how God, this, this is a man that God honored in what he did because he did it for the Lord. Second principle is Noah's faith involved this uh, bold propaganda uh, proclamation that, that involved rebuke. It was a message of rebuke. Because it says, by which he condemned the world. Second Peter says it this way. And did not spare the ancient world, this is God, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. He was a preacher. He wasn't just a shipbuilder. He preached during that time and he was a preacher of righteousness. You need to do what's right in the sight of God was you can see his message. You say, well, maybe it was pretty easy congregation. Well, let's look at his congregation. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There's your description of your congregation, the people he was out in the world having to preach it to, that they were their every, not every now and then, but every intent of their heart, the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. Oh, what a black, dark backdrop. Oh, what a people that were wicked and had nothing and wanted nothing to do with the Lord, but how bright this man would shine forth. He didn't take a poll or a vote in society to say, how do you people think I ought to be preaching? Or take a poll of what do you think we ought to be doing? And he, unlike them, did not put off building the ark. He could have told God, yeah, I'll do that when I get a little more time. 
He started building. He didn't put it. Don't you know Satan bombarded him immensely? Put it off. It ain't raining now. Just if you get a shower, then start. If you get a few sprinkles, then start. You know, God will give you a sign. No. He had every temptation to put this thing off and build it later, take care of it later. It's not going. And can you imagine the ridicule? As neighbors and people would come over and say, what is this? Well, this is a boat so that when it floods, when God sends all this water, it's going to float and anybody that repents, get right with God, can get inside and, we'll, and they'll you know, be saved. <laughs> yeah, right. What is rain to start with? Well, that's just stuff that'll come down from the sky. Yeah, right. But God's going to destroy the earth. No. And you're out here working on this thing. You're wasting your time. You didn't even take a vacation last year. Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to keep building because it's going to happen. Can you imagine the conversations at the local beauty shop, barber shop, grocery store, hardware store? Do you know what that nut job Noah down there, have you seen that? Oh, yeah, we all know about that. That's been in the newspaper. That guy's a nut. He's building what's called a ship to float when it's never rained. I mean, they ought to put that guy in a psychiatric hospital. I know he's a kook. I'm sure every local event, every national event, I'm sure they never would invite him because he's insane. We're not going to invite him to our home. We're not going to invite him to our parties. Any event, he'll be excluded for sure. Because he's probably even going to bring up when he's at the party, has everybody repented and got ready to get in the ark? And we don't want to hear that nonsense and ruin our party. I mean, when you're just getting ready to eat your food, that'll make you nauseous hearing all that kind of talk. So he was put down and he was always, I'm sure, excluded. And I'm sure a lot of people said, you know what? His preaching's a little too judgmental and I don't know it for sure but I believe probably during that time became the first establishment of the seeker sensitive church because we can raise up a man just like him who will say this God is a God of love and he never would do anything to hurt you he loves us and he's going to bless us well all those things are true but he also judges sin and he wants sin preached. And he wants righteousness preached. And they said, but we don't like that kind of church. We'll build a big church. We'll get a lot of people because we'll get somebody to stand up and say, it's all right. God's a God of love. And all those people will go home happy because they won't be going, oh gosh, that rain's going to come. That flood's going to come. That makes people nervous. And they have enough things in their daily lives to not have more worry and concern. So let's just kind of push Noah aside and listen to somebody that's not that judgmental. Don't you know that happened? They didn't want to hear what he said, but they don't want to hear what today's preachers are saying. You cannot tell us what's wrong and what's right. I don't. We don't. This does. And God does. I, I, we just say what's in here. And don't you know that's what they were saying? It's not going to flood. It hadn't flooded yet. But see, the issue is, even though mankind then and mankind now says, if I don't believe it's so, it won't be so. And mankind says this too. I really don't believe that's true. I think this is what God really meant. You see, there is another kind of law, a physical law, called the law of gravity. Right? There is the law of gravity. Now, I can say, I don't like the law of gravity. I've heard somebody tell me what it is. It's saying that if you're up there high and you fall, gravity is going to take you to the ground and you're going to go splat. But see, I don't like that kind of law. So what I'm going to do is to say, I don't believe that is what the law really means. So I'm going to get up on the Empire State Building because I believe this. I know there's a law of gravity, but I don't think it works when the sun's not out. 
And I don't think the law of gravity works if I flap my arms real fast. Now that's what I believe, and I don't care what Christians say, that's what I believe. And that's all it is. And I'm gonna say that's just because I believe it, that's going to, listen, if I get up on the Empire State Building and I jump, it doesn't matter what I believe. I'm flat dead. If I believe it, I'm dead. If I don't believe it, I'm dead. Guess what? The law of gravity is not going to change for Tim Strickland. No matter how he views it. You know, you see that deal. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. But that's not true. God believes it, that settles it. If Tim Strickland believes it or doesn't believe it, that's not the case. The law of gravity is going to splat me. Because it's the law. You know, that's what it's going to, it's going to be in the last days. Jesus said, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the, uh, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. I wonder what it's going to be like when he comes. It's going to be like just like it was in Noah. They're doing just their everyday life. They're going to marriages and getting married and they're drinking and they're eating. They're just going around with life and could care less what God says. That's the deal. We're just going along with life. We're going on our vacations. We're working and got marriages and we go to eat. Some people, it's not just strictly I hate God. Some people, it's just... I'm just going to exclude God and go wrong with just what normal living is because I'm a pretty good person. See, they were just excluding God. They're just doing what they're doing, but no mention of concern about what God wants. And so shall it be when Jesus comes back. Psalm says this, Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding. What does that mean? Horses like to go ahead. Once I rode my sister-in-law's horse and I made the mistake not knowing that when I turned back toward the barn, we were going to have trouble with that horse because you, nobody told me when you, when you run a horse back toward the barn, they're going to run. It's going to be hard. It was just hold, whoa, you know. It was just all I could to keep it from going because it was heading back toward the barn. The scripture means horses want to go ahead. Oh, but mules just the opposite. Just stubborn as a mule. Just, you got to just, come on, get up. Come on, get with it. Bible's saying, don't be like either one of those two. Don't go ahead of God and don't be so stubborn that you just sit there and you won't do what God says. Because that's what these people were doing. They thought, I'm sure they were ahead of God in their intellect, or they just stubbornly said, I'm not going to do what God says. I don't care what he says. I got some things on my mind that I want to do. So shall it be when Jesus comes back. And then the last thing, Noah's faith was proved by his imputed righteousness. And he, that is, he became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. See, Noah was saved like we are. It's all by grace through faith, as we mentioned last Sunday in the message. It says in Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found favor. Some of your versions say grace. He found grace in the eyes of God. And Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. And Noah, he walked with God. You know, he's a great-grandson of Enoch who walked with God and didn't see death. And here Noah is walking with God. He wasn't righteous in his own light. This means he didn't work to get righteous. His righteousness was imputed and then therefore he worked like we mentioned last Sunday. He got his righteousness the same way we did by grace. He came to God he came to God the way we do as sinners and he found mercy and he found grace. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt.
For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Wow. What a description of the world today. Corrupt. You know, a lot of people don't see the corruption. The older you are, you do. You know, if you're younger, you don't because you've only seen whatever is your span. But the older you live, you see it is worse because you at least have a longer perspective. And the longer you've lived, the more perspective you're saying, this is getting worse. I can say that because just in my short lifetime, I can see that. We know wickedness has always existed, but we see that this world is in a snowball and the ball gets bigger faster than ever. Why? Because the Lord is coming back. Genesis 7, 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone. Wow. You alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. Wow. A lot of people on the earth and just one. For after seven more days, you've heard of the two-minute warning in football? This was the seven-day warning. I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I've made. It's over. I'm going to get rid of it. Noah stood righteous, and that doesn't mean he was perfect, but he was blameless in his integrity. He was walking with God, not in perfection, but he wanted to please God. Like a star in a dark night, he shone forth. A young man once told Socrates, I quote, I hate you because every time I meet you, you show me what I am. Why did, he, why did this man hate Socrates? Because every time he met him, he saw what he was. That's why this world hates Christians so much. We are probably the most despised people on the planet. Not with everybody, I'm saying, but globally, we're the ones mocked, ridiculed. Why? Because that righteousness makes the light on unright. That doesn't mean we're perfect. We're not saying they're better than anybody. It's all saved by grace. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. But that light, that proclamation... That rebuke is hated. It's hated with a passion. First Peter says, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, God was patient. He gave that last 120 day warning. Then he gave that last seven day warning indicating that that patience was about to stop. Love is patient, the scripture says. 1 Corinthians 13, that's the first on the list, and he does show love. But before this event ever started, it started with this in Genesis 6, 3. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. This is how he started this story out, saying my spirit's not always going to strive with man. There will be a limit. It's going to stop. That spirit, the spirit that the, of the living God, that spirit that's there to convict, that that limit's going to be within this window of 120 years. See, a lot of things that we do, the Bible, even Ecclesiastes say that it's the heart of men to sin. Why? Because the punishment of, a, of, a, of an offense is not quickly done. See, it's everything we did wrong, God would zap us with this electrical current. And we'd do something else wrong. Then we'd probably be prone to get faster, right, I would think. You know, at 220 every time would just, okay. I think I'll do it. No, I remember, ooh, that's going to happen as soon as I do it. But because there's a delay, people and Satan tempts us to say, ain't nothing happened to you when you've done it before. So go ahead and do it again. See, God says, my spirit's not always going to be patient like this. I am going to draw a line of limitation. And so Noah his family, and those animals two by two get in the boat. 
And we all think, why didn't Noah, as they were coming up, why didn't he do a little J.J. Watt one of these as those mos two mosquitoes were about to come in? Say, uh, 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 back, 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 back. But he didn't. He's got a reason. We don't know what that is, but he let them in as well. And then the door was closed. The door was closed. Drip, 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 drip. And then it all let go. And I don't imagine anybody as that water started ankle high and then knee high. I don't think anybody was laughing anymore. I don't believe anybody was ruling Mr. Noah anymore. I don't believe anybody was saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't believe anybody said he's preaching a little too righteous. I don't believe anybody said, oh, he's preaching out of not love. I don't believe anybody said that what he's saying is not good and true. I don't believe anybody was saying that as the water just kept getting a little higher and then it was waist high. I don't think anybody was saying, man, I'm wishing, I'm glad I'm listening to that, that other kind of little soft preaching. No, nobody was laughing then. And then as it got about that high, I'm sure a few people said, I wish I'd listened. Oh, the door was open. All I had to do was step on board and just do what God said. But I waited I waited too long and the doors closed. Paul Harvey tells the story of how Eskimos go out to kill their wolves. He said an Eskimo will take their knife and they'll coat it with blood and let that blood freeze out in that cold climate. And then the Eskimo will coat it again with another layer of blood, animal blood, and it'll freeze. And he gets that coated and coated and coated till he builds up a good, good coat of frozen blood over that knife. And then he takes the handle and takes it out in the woods and buries the handle where the knife blade coated in big, thick coat of frozen blood exists. And then the wolves come up. Oh, that smell! Is there a better smell in the world to a wolf than the smell of animal blood. No, there's not. And so they're gravitated to go to that knife and they lick it, the first lick. Mm, this isn't a trap. This is good blood. And they lick and they lick and they lick and they lick and they lick. Ooh, this is good stuff. At first I thought this may be a trap. Oh no. Ain't nothing happened to me yet. But they lick enough to where it numbs their tongue. So that when they get down to the blade, that blade that Satan always puts in that frozen good stuff, to where it begins to cut their tongue, they A, don't know it's cut their tongue because it's numb, and B, they can't differ differentiate now between swallowing their own blood and swallowing the blood of the animal. And the Eskimo simply goes out the next day and he knows he's going to have him a wolf laying dead next to his knife. What's so wrong in society with one little lick of sin? Well, because it'll probably make you lick one more time and one more time to where you'll end up being numb to anything that's dangerous, which the first lick's dangerous, but it's going to numb you and numb me to the danger. And eventually I'll say to myself, there's nothing wrong with this at all because I don't feel anything wrong. The numbing effect of sin in an individual and in the culture, and in a nation, and in a society, and in the world. It comes one lick at a time. And the numbness comes one lick at a time. But God provides a way out every time. Even with individual sin, the scripture says there's always a way of escape. With 
salvation, there's also a way of escape. He did it in the New Testament in Jesus, and here in the Old Testament, it was in the ark. It was a preparation of something that would save me from judgment. The Bible said that God gave instruction that this thing was supposed to be coated in pitch. And if you look up the Hebrew word pitch, it's the same root word used in the word atonement in the Bible. It was something put on the boat that would keep the judgment waters from attacking those who would put their faith inside the ark for salvation. See, if you're inside the boat and it leaks, you're no good anyway. You're just going to die in the boat because you're going to drown. You just didn't drown there, you're going to drown there. Right? You need something that keeps the judgment waters out and that's atonement. That's the pitch. And Noah and them were saved because they had pitch around them. They had the blood of Jesus like we do in our atonement. Those waters won't touch us because we step in to salvation in Jesus and those judgment waters will not touch us. This boat also would carry them from this spot to the place of rest. Did you catch that one? My Jesus is going to carry me here to my ultimate place of rest, and I don't have to worry about it. But Brother Tim, you're going to die. He's going to carry me safely. And just like the Bible, the Bible says that that ark rested on Mount Ariat. Do you know what day it rested there? You have to do some research, but it if you want to know the date, it was on Nisan 17. You can just kind of look at the Jewish map. I don't have time to go over that. Do you know what day Jesus resurrected from the dead? Nisan 17! Don't you think that's not coincidental? God said, I'm going to make that bad boy rest on that day, and my son's going to resurrect on that same day all those years later. God said, it's all going to be a matter of rest that you can rest your souls if you put your security in that ark, in my son, who will be the ultimate atonement. You will be safe. A saved sinner. I think we're in that day. Do you know what the number one boy name in all of 2014 was? Noah. What does that mean? I don't know, but it may mean something. I thought it was interesting to, for God to say, we're going to make the number one name. In the times that we live in, will people stand up and be a Noah to proclaim the truth and say, I don't care if I get ridiculed and mocked and made fun of. I'm going to stand in the midst of everything. One year and 10 days later, that door was opened up. Do you know who closed that door? Yes. God. Because you're inside. Now we're thinking... Well, this isn't going to do any good. I'm in here. Who's going to close the door? There was one door. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no man comes to me except through me. <laughs> that's why there was only one door, and that's why God shut it. God said, this was all my idea. This was all my plan. This was all my idea, all my way of keeping the water out. And now you're in the door and I'm going to close it and you're safe and secure. And everybody outside, I'm sure screaming and clawing on that thing. I'm sure when it rested, you could probably see the scratch marks down that wood. People hollering and screaming to get in that thing now. But God had already closed that door. My spirit will not always strive with man. When the Bible talks to us in conviction, that's when we respond. It's easy for us to look at all of society and say, boy, look at what this whole world's doing. It's another thing to say, Lord, what am I doing? If you were doing that flood today, would I be the one that you came to and said, you the one. You're living for me and walking with me. I want to use you to do what I need to get done. We do need to look at that in our life and say, Lord, I want to be all you can be because this is the last days. Whether it's today 
or 120 years or whatever. We don't know what it's going to be, but we're in the last of the last days. And we need to be ready. And we need to be like Noah, to take a stand, to make a difference, to have a message, to preach righteousness, and to not be ashamed of it. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be proclaimed from not only the pulpits of America, they should be proclaimed from our own lips. Because God is looking for righteous men and righteous women to be his Noah. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you stand to your feet.